Hello everyone, my name is Lewis Hodder. I'm an advanced care paramedic working out of Brisbane, Queensland. And today I'm going to be covering airway positioning, airway manoeuvres, which link in together, as well as bag valve mass ventilation. With our airway positions, we're going to cover lateral, supine, semi-recumbent, which will tie into ramping, which is a part of our airway manoeuvres. Here we have the patient in the right lateral position. Now this is the gold standard for aspiration protection as secretions will pull out of the mouth onto the pillow below. Some cons to this, however, is access to the patient, especially if we're in an ambulance. It's very difficult to manipulate, trying to get the patient to the sniffing position and such. Another consideration is tropopnea, which is usually something that happens to a conscious patient where you get short of breath and being on their side, but the reason they get that is because of a VQ mismatching and advanced lung disease. So this may not be the position of choice, particularly in those advanced lung disease patients. This is the patient in the sublime position. It does have the benefit of hemodynamic support, particularly in the anaphylaxis patient. However, beyond that, there are a lot of cons to this position. There's three big ones with the airway. First one being aspiration risk is very high. Second, tongue and structures rest against the posterior pharynx, causing potentially an airway obstruction. We also see a reduction in the thyromental distance and malalignment of, depending which model you use, the axes, curves, or columns. Beyond that, we also have issues with the lungs. We get a decreased functional residual capacity, decreased alveolar recruitment, and decreased amounts of usable lung tissue. So this is the recumbent position. Uh, this position really addresses many of the cons of the supine positioning. I'm going to talk a bit more about that when I talk about ramping, but I just want you to notice the difference between this and the ramping. So this is the ramping position in contrast to the semi-recumbent. We ensure that the stretcher is greater than 30 degrees angle. We pad underneath usually the shoulders to push the shoulders and thorax up and forward. And really we usually do this in conjunction with the sniffing position and the padding underneath the head. And the point of this is to align the ear canal with the sternal notch, which is pretty good here. This is really important in our obese and our pregnant patients with that large abdominal contents pushing up against the diaphragm and splinting the lung. This position increases functional residual capacity and improves oxygenation. The tongue is less likely to fall posteriorly. It decreases the aspiration risk and it is associated with increased or better laryngoscopy views. It is associated with decreased intubation and airway related complications as well. And it really does address some of those complications we talked about with supine positioning. I just wanted to show the difficulty in getting that ear canal parallel with that sternal notch in the supine patient. So I have a pillow and a blanket underneath the head of this mannequin. And if you draw a straight line, we're still well below that sternal notch in this patient. With a mild ramp such as this, we really get up and equal with that sternal notch. Probably the most fundamental airway maneuver is tri triple airway. So in the absence of C-spine problems, we do a head tilt, jaw thrust, moving the tongue and mandible anteriorly, then open up with our chin lift to gain a good view of the oropharynx. A less contemporary airway maneuver is to rotate the head 45 degrees. And this is associated with an increase in retroglossal space and also an increase in mean expiratory volume in bag valve mass. So it may be relevant to our asthma patients, for example, and we can still apply that two finger bag valve mass ventilator. It is important to note in the setting of a C-spine injury that head tilt and really probably sniffing position with the, with the elevation of the head up may be quite limited and make some of our airway maneuvers quite difficult. So this is the uh, Mayo bag valve mask, the adult version that we'll be using. So this is a reservoir bag, holds um, all the high concentration of oxygen that we want to deliver to our patient. We have a valve here that prevents expired air going back in and diluting it. We also have another valve which prevents the collapse of a bag and suffocation to the patient. So if we breathe with the clove, it will collapse. We have a delivery bag, that's 1.5 litres, stroke volume of 1.2. We'll put on the expiratory flow valve here. So that means that without ventilating the patient, we're still giving a high fraction of oxygen to the patient. About 95% both ventilating and non-ventilating in this case. It is important to note the setup of your bag valve mask. So I'll bring your attention to the filter, which is the patient's side of all the other adjuncts attached. Then look at the peep valve, which is attached to the expiratory flow port. All these adjuncts add up and increase the mechanical dead space, which is undesirable for the patient. For this procedure, PPE is crucial. Gloves, glasses, P2 mask, uh, and or gown. Uh, for this procedure, in the sake of the VR, I'll not be wearing a mask and gown. Beyond safety equipment, it is the role of the airway assistant to really get a lot of this equipment ready. So as we're progressing with the early stages of the bag valve mask, we need to have the laryngoscope and McGill's ready to go, as well as suction for emergent airway management. We also need to have the LMA ready, if we do need to go down that route with 
lubricant, OPA, tape, the syringe, SVO2 and ETO2, all needing to come in quick succession to facilitate the bag valve mask. We also have oxygen just down here as well and obviously monitoring to ensure that we do get a successful approach. Um, and later in the stages we can consider PEEP as well. When talking about the indications of the bag valve mask, the QAS talks about inadequate ventilation or apnea. But it's also important to consider PEEP and its indications because that is a justification for using the bag valve mask, as well as RSI for pre-oxygenation. The key to the indication for the bag valve mask is an adequate ventilation, not oxygenation, for the patient's need. Contraindications can be summarised as simply adequate ventilation. Precautions and complications include insufflation of the stomach and aspiration risk, increased intrathoracic pressures and concomitant risks associated, and pneumothorax transformation, transforming a pneumothorax into a tension pneumothorax. It also includes limited airway aspiration protection. It is a labor intensive skill and the patient is vulnerable breath to breath. With decision making, we need to ascertain the requirements of the patient. Do they actually need ventilation or can they just be given high flow O2 and oxygenation? What is their requirement in regards to ventilation? Do they need a high minute volume, such as in a DKA or a low minute volume, such as an asthmatic? And would they benefit from an adjunct such as PEEP? I will now demonstrate the skill of bag valve mask ventilation. So the first step would be ramping the patient, placing them in the sniffing position, aligning the ear canal with the sternal notch, placing two MPAs and an OPA, maximising every opportunity for us to get good seal, good airway and good ventilation, a step down approach rather than a step up. From here, we will be using a two handed technique on the bag valve mask. Ideally we'd have a second operator squeezing the bag, but here we're going to go two thumbs Cross, six fingers on the mandible, pulling up into the bag or into the mask. Then from here, as a single operator, we can still do this very easily with a chicken wing approach. And here I'm delivering really good ventilation. Once I know that still works, I can possibly graduate down to the C grip approach. So how do we measure whether we've been successful with our ventilations? Well, the first is the tactile sensation from the bag. Is it a brick or is it moving air? Do we have an escape? Can we hear air moving around the side of the mask? No. And then do we have good rise and fall? Can we oscillate? And what is the ETCO2 and SPO2 doing? What is the physiological response of our patient to our intervention? In regards to troubleshooting and problems, we can summarize them into the three columns theory. We can have anterior problems, such as a small mandible. We can have mid middle column or lumen problems, such as airway obstruction secondary to edema. Or we can have posterior problems, such as a C-spine injury where we can't really flex that C-spine. These problems can be solved sometimes with the basic maneuvers we've already done, such as ramping, the sniffing position, and the airway adjuncts. However, sometimes they also require some specialised troubleshooting skills, which we will talk about later. Failed ventilation occurs due to poor seal, airway obstruction, and poor physiological response. We'll be talking about poor seal and airway obstruction in regards to our troubleshooting procedures. The poor seal, we need to do a two, at least a two-person technique, maybe even with a jaw thrust to be a third-person technique in a ramped patient who is in the sniffing position, whose ear canal is equal with the, or aligned with their sternal notch. I've included in my algorithm two specific causes of a poor seal, the indentulous and bearded patient. The indentulous patient can be very hard to bag valve mask. Um, a common strategy to address this is the movement of the bag valve mask superiorly with that bottom level on the lower lip. Again, we can still use our two-handed approach, even as a single officer, and there we go. If we have a bearded patient, we can apply some lubricant around the beard itself to try and improve that surface area for the mask. And then again, we're doing our two-handed, graduated down approach to bag that mask ventilation. Upon failure to ventilate the patient after troubleshooting with a poor seal, you should graduate to a uh, supraglottic airway or LMA or eye gel. If upon failure of that, you should then escalate again to an ETT or surgical airway. However, this is beyond the scope of this video. Another cause of failed ventilation would be airway obstruction. This could be caused by something like a foreign body, in which case direct laryngoscopy, which should not be covered in this video, should occur with the use of McGill's to remove it. Alternatively, laryngospasm can also occur, and we'll talk about some of the physical maneuvers we can do to treat this. If we do encounter laryngospasm, ideally this would be done as a two-man crew, but we could apply pressure 
to Larson's point at the rams of the mandible and push forward to try and disengage. Alternatively, we can attach peak to our bag valve mask and do it together, trying to encourage increased expiratory pressure. Upon failure to resolve the laryngospasm with physical maneuvers, paralytics and anesthetics should be used to resolve this. Alternatively, if an airway obstruction can't be resolved, we should graduate to an ETT or surgical airway, which is again beyond the scope of the Once airway and ventilation control has been established, we need to be thinking about the requirements of the patient. What is the ventilation requirement? We need to be careful not to overinflate and cause aspiration. Does this patient require PEEP or a more advanced intervention such as RSI for more definitive control, particularly of those physiological parameters? Those parameters that will determine the success of our interventions and help us decide whether we can use alternative devices such as ETT, SGA or high flow O2 and PEEP. Thank you for listening to my presentation on airway positioning, maneuvers and bag valve mask ventilation.